Great. Well, it looks like we've hit 12.01. Um, I'll go ahead and get started with some stuff. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining our Lunch with the Friends program this week. My name is Maya Swope, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Um, we're glad you're here this afternoon to learn more about, you know, what to do in the Boundary Waters and what not to do. Um, and so we've got a really great presentation um, up ahead here. Um, if anyone's not familiar with Friends of the Boundary Waters, we are a nonprofit that's been around for more than 40 years, working to protect the Boundary Waters, to educate folks about the Boundary Waters. Um, and we do a lot of work with advocacy, with community building, and with bringing people up to the Boundary Waters. Um, so we're, yeah, we're excited to have you join us for this. If anyone has questions throughout the presentation, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, um, so you can put any questions in there. Um, there also is a chat button, so if you have either technical issues or just sort of commentary throughout the presentation, the chat feature is a great place for that. Um, and feel free to shoot me a message if you're having trouble hearing or anything along those lines. This presentation will be recorded, so if there's you know, things that you want to remember, um, we will be recording this and posting it to our YouTube page, and I will make sure to send out a link to folks um, later on, probably tomorrow, with, with the recording and with some links as well. Um, so with all of that, I'm excited to welcome our guest, Tiger Bodwin. I hope I said your name right. Um, he's been a, you know, an expert in some ways in paddling and leading people in the boundary waters, has a lot of miles of canoeing under his belt, um, and so has some really good advice um, for all of us. Um, so we're excited to have you here, Tiger. Thanks for presenting and for, for coming on the, the webinar today. Um, I will just go ahead and turn it over to you. Hi, and thanks, everyone. I have been uh, paddling and camping in the Boundary Waters since the tender age of 13 when my parents dropped me off at Widgeewagon Camp on Burnside Lake, for those of you who know it, and immersed me in a week of more mosquitoes than uh, you can imagine. And uh, I just fell in love with the Boundary Waters. I'm about to turn uh, 60, so I've, you know, I've had plenty of time to make just about every misadventure possible in the Boundary Waters. And as a result of all that gray hair and experience, I wanna share with you a handful of things that will make your trip safer, more enjoyable, and just some hacks that you can use to impress your friends. Uh, and so Maya, if you would run a little poll, I'm just curious to see amongst our group, you know, how many of you are coming to the Boundary Waters for the first time, and this is pure discovery, how many of you have been a few times? How many of you are, you know, old hands? Uh, because uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to comment and ask questions and add into these many fun ideas. Uh, and while you're filling out that poll, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a little TikTok that my lovely daughter made from our trip last year to get us get us in the mood for the upcoming season. So it's going to be another uh, great season. I can't see the answers, Maya, but if you have a... All right. Oh, we have some first timers. Hey, welcome. And look at all 31% over 20 times. What are you doing in this webinar? I, I hope I've got something new for you. Wow, that's great. Okay. Um, Here's uh, here's what um, just a little a little housekeeping for how the presentation is going to go. Maya will send out this um, link when we're done. Excuse me, that can stop uh, this tiny URL backslash portage uh, as a way for you to come back to the presentation. The reason you might want to is I've embedded a whole series of links to both products that you may want to buy, but most importantly, and this is my biggest gift to everybody watching. It's the world's most complete packing list. 
So when you click on this link after you receive it, this um, presentation, it'll open up uh, a database of camping gear and food. And it's set up in a way that will allow you to view it in a grid view or maybe a caban view if you prefer that or a gallery view. But you know, those are the different views. And then you can, you know, you can access it as a camping food list for two, camping gear list for three, camping gear list for the summer, uh, food list for vegetarians. Um, and uh, I'm going to move this so you can see if you just go up here to the right and copy the base, which you'll be able to do, you can get a copy for yourself for free and modify it to your uh, particular needs. So I hope uh, I hope you'll accept this gift uh, for coming to the presentation. Um, there's there's a reason that uh, over the years I've made this most complete packing list, uh, and this this text from my wife kind of sums it up. So here I am, uh, halfway to Ely. I live in the Twin Cities. I'm maybe three hours into the drive, and I <laughs> get a text from Linda that says. Just checking you didn't mean to take the three bags of food from downstairs, the red, the green, etc. bags. And uh, and it turns out I packed them all down there. And so my response back to her is, oh, for goodness sake, you know, Zups, the grocery store up in Ely is open till seven. Paragus is open till nine. That's the outfitter. You know, when you get back to the house, can you photograph the contents and I'll shop? I'm hoping to be in Ely by 530. And uh Here's, you know, here's the result. <laughs> Somehow, I had loaded the entire car, canoe, paddles, fishing gear, and left behind a week of breakfast, a week of lunch, a week of dinners. Uh, and so that started the, you know, started the process of doing more of a organized checklist of everything as you're loading it into the car. So uh, please feel free to uh, copy and uh, use that approach. Um, today we're going to cover, uh, you know, s 10 critical areas of, of enjoyment in the Boundary Waters from paddling to route planning. And we'll just go through them one at a time with uh, thoughts, tips, and tricks. Uh, and I'm going to start um, with one because um, when I'm up at the Outfitters and there are others around and they offer a spare paddle. This is Thought number one, always accept the spare paddle. I know it seems like paddles have gotten really strong over the years. I mean, if you look at this, you know, this beautiful Viper, it's got a rock guard tip and it seems like you couldn't break them. But the truth is they're, they're actually surprisingly easy to shatter when you're paddling hard against the wind and your, you know, your blade hits a rock or you're being pushed towards shore on a windy day and you're just trying to land safely uh, and you know frankly if this breaks you don't have enough duct tape with you to get back so I you know I always carry a spare in this example you see me with a kayak paddle because I'm out solo um, but it's a it's a great idea to have a spare you can just strap it into the side of the canoe and never worry about it a second uh, trick that uh, I learned when I was um, excuse me when I was at Wijiwagan is something called the shotgun technique. So, you know, approaching land or approaching uh, a rock, people will sometimes use the blade to stop themselves. And that's the first way you're going to break the blade. Um, so instead, flip the paddle around and hold it like a shotgun in your shoulder. Put the other end under, you know, for the bow person, put the other end under the water and then use that to bounce off the rocks. You're basically a big shock absorber that slows the canoe down. And I tell you what, you cannot, you just can't break this end. Uh, and you'll, you know, believe me, you'll be thankful. And even if, you know, it isn't for you, uh, there have been occasions where I've come across other campers who have, you know, lost or broken a, a paddle and, and have tried to jury rig something. Uh, and so having the gift of being able to swap it out uh, is really uh, just a nice, you know, it's that Boundary Waters ethic. See if you can help someone else out. So that's uh, the paddle. Uh, here I've got just a beautiful picture of Disappointment Lake. 
Uh, and there, there, you know, I don't know if you can tell, but there's something great about this picture, and then there's something absolutely wrong about this picture. And what's great is, is frankly, you know, the weather is beautiful, but what's wrong is that this boat is just gently lodged up against the shore. And even though I have a bow line with me, it's not tied up. I think I probably stepped out to have a, have a quick tinkle and didn't tie up the canoe, but if you don't tie up your canoe, if you don't add a bow line every time, they are super cheap and easy to make, right? A rope, two carabiners. They weigh nothing. You can use a bungee dealy bob to attach them. Uh, they will absolutely save you because these new canoes weigh 40 pounds, the slightest breeze, and you can find yourself in a situation like this. So you, you really, you just, you don't want to be that, <laughs> that person who at the end of a portage, you know, set down, <laughs> set down the canoe and stepped away for a moment to just, just to turn around and grab the next pack that they were going to load in, really taking the time to just unclip and throw that rope around a tree, a rock, a root, uh, will <laughs> save you from this kind of experience. Uh, and the other benefit is, you know, they're really easy to just tie up so that when you're portaging, uh, they're largely out of your way, but they're always there. And that allows you then to take that same rope, which is carabinered to your bow, and run it through your packs, right, to your stern. And why do this? Because, you know, you think you're never going to flip. But uh, it's happened to me. We had a guest. Uh, we had a guest who had a different dog. This Rufus the Buddha dog knows how to, you know, stay calm on the canoe. But this dog took a jump, and in reaching to try and catch him, you know, we flipped the whole canoe. And had we not had the rope through all of our gear, uh, I can tell you, it's always the pack with a cook kit. You know, that's the heavy one that sinks right down to the bottom. And you know what, once you've lost your cook kit, the trip's kind of over. Uh, and so um, that's a great idea. And the other thing, should you happen to flip, for those of you who are brand new to the Boundary Waters, you know, the canoe will not sink. It's got two sealed air pockets in the bow and the stern. It's actually, you should always be wearing your life vest, but it's actually a life preserver in and of itself. And so if this rope is also there, you won't be scrabbling to try and, you know, hold on to a slippery surface. It's just, uh, it just does so many things for you. I just encourage you to get in the habit of, you know, always um, attaching that bow rope and pulling it across when you're paddling. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's easy to do, it takes seconds, it's worth it every time. So that's paddling. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, life vests. Please, please, please always wear them. The number of times I've been in the Boundary Waters and I've seen folks without them and you just, here's the thing, you don't know when you're going to have a stroke. You know, something completely unexpected and that life vest will uh, save your life. And if you put just four simple things in it, it will do you even, uh, do you even more good. Um, one is a waterproof uh, fire starter, so that that could be something like, you know, like this. This is a, it's called wet fire. It's just something that you can light even when wet. You tear open this package and light it, but you, you need something to actually light the fire. I like this waterproof fire starter, and I'm just going to show you how the links work. You know, when you get this presentation, if you're interested in getting, you know, something like this fire sleeve, it's very clever. It's you know, it, you just, it's basically a waterproof covering for a Bic lighter. Um, and it floats and it's waterproof and it's uh, easy to fit in your um, life vest. Another thing you can fit in your life vest is an emergency blanket. These little, you know, these are the things you see runners in after the marathon. Again, they weigh nothing. You can just, you know, get it into your life vest and have it there for the one time you do dump. And, and you'll just be surprised how the shock of it all um, you can, you know, can leave you a little bit disabled. So it's good to have one for yourself or, or your friend. And then always check for a whistle, an emergency whistle. A lot of the newer life vests from the 
uh, outfitters now actually have a, a whistle built into the buckle. So it's just something to know about. And then in the thwart bag, you know, if you, if you don't have a thwart bag, I recommend renting one or getting one. Uh, because what, <laughs> what sometimes tips over the canoe is, you know, it starts to rain or you see something in the distance and, you know, you want to get into your pack. And of course your pack's down, uh, in the, in the base of the canoe. And so in reaching over to try and get into your pack, you know, it's surprisingly easy to tip the canoe. Um, and so I'd always keep a bug net and then just for temperature control, you know, the fastest way to get warm is just throw on a beanie or the fastest way to get cool is to take your sun hat and, you know, dip it in the lake and get it wet and keep it on top of you. And either of those will, you know, feel like a 10 degree difference and get you through some of the, uh, the more challenging times. I also uh, have learned the hard way uh, to get a small pair of binoculars. And I mean cheap. I think these were actually a sort of a, a gift from the University of Michigan, like a visit. Um, but here's why. It's not actually for spotting eagles and other birds. If you're a serious birder, get, you know, get something better. This is so that that day where you're paddling hard and it's late and you get to the big lake and that campsite's taken, that campsite's taken, that campsite's taken. What I used to do was pick one side and paddle the entire lake trying to figure out where the campsite was open. And now I just paddle into the middle of the lake and have a quick look around. And, you know, it's surprisingly easy to spot whether the campsite is taken or not. I guarantee you this will save you an hour or more on the day you need it most, when you are most tired, when it is getting dark, and you just have to find that campsite because everything's full as it has been during the pandemic. All right. Uh, if you have not yet discovered this magic thing called a bungee dealy bob, million uses it's basically a little elastic lock that you know you can use to tie socks to a tree and let them dry um, but also use them to keep your portaging uh, neat and tidy so that you're not that dumpster fire coming across the portage getting in everybody's way so you can attach you know whether it's your bow line to the front or your paddle to your canoe or keep your you know keep your <laughs> your fishing pole from snagging and snapping because you get it caught in a tree while portaging uh, these things they're inexpensive and you can never have too many of them million uses uh, and you know to, to sort of illustrate the point before I knew about bungee dealy bobs this is my son when he was five he's 26 now um, you know <laughs> really dumb look at this I've got a paddle that's you know sticking out and just waiting to hit a tree there's two paddles where we're going to trip and fall and break both of the blades and find ourselves you know on some random lake not able to get home or or how about this safety don't uh you know uh trip fall and strangle yourself so instead of that use a bungee dealy bob keep your paddles up inside when you're portaging and give your child a gallon size ziploc and tell them to go you know look for uh, fire starter. This is a great way to keep kids occupied, you know, who otherwise might find a portage really daunting. But if it's a treasure hunt, uh, you know, they love it. And by the way, you know, it might be raining when you get to wherever your destination is. So having some nice dry tinder uh, can't, can't hurt. Um, okay, another favorite uh, topic related to Portaging. I'm um, I'm mostly an oatmeal guy, except you know when in Ely, and I start my day with the best breakfast ever at Britain's, uh, and um, you know there <laughs> there can be a consequence. You know you paddle for two three hours, and if you're paddling right and using your core and bearing down, you might find that also in that thwart bag you want to put a little cat hole digger. Uh, these things are, this is, you know, a little titanium one. They weigh nothing. Uh, they're handy for a bunch of purposes, like cleaning, you know, cleaning out the uh, coals under the fire grate when you get to the campsite. But, but in this particular instance, what I'm thinking about is, you know, having it handy uh, for that first portage uh, when you're just desperate. Uh, and, you know, because there is never a convenient tree log that has fallen over by the side of the portage at just the right height, 
uh, it's a great thing to learn the Anderson lean, uh, which you can do with a minimum of space uh, and uh, without getting very undressed. And uh, I, you know, post portage, you'll be you'll just be that much lighter and happier. Um, another you know trick I learned, but uh, many many years later, uh, is for the evening run. Um, so it's 1 a.m. It's 2 a.m. It's pouring out, and you just don't want to get out. Uh, of the tent and have a tinkle. Uh, if you happen to have a glow-in-the-dark Nalgene that you save for that purpose uh, specifically, um, it's <laughs> it's it's a it can be a lifesaver. Uh, and my uh, my female friends tell me, look, it's wide mouth. It works just fine. So um, you know you may want to consider that uh, instead of getting out of the tent uh, every evening if you're of a certain age. The other uh, thing about arriving at camp, a first thing to do is to bungee dealy bob your um, fishing poles, you know, to a tree. And why bungee dealy bob them instead of just leaning them up? Well, we had flown into the bottle portage, so into you know into the Quetico. So this is you know airplane uh, with canoes attached. Uh, my nephews were up there and um, didn't attach them to the tree. Uh, they fell over, and a nephew, not seeing them, stepped on them and broke the tip. Uh, so that was one fishing pole gone right away. And same thing, it's basically useless at that point. So just a habit uh, of, of attaching your, you know, really tying up your fishing poles uh, keeps them out of the way, keeps you from getting hooked. And the other thing I like to attach to the tree in the same place is the med kit. So everybody knows where it is in case of any sort of accident. Uh, also, highly recommend that you learn multiple tarp configurations, and this link will take you to a great uh, website that you know shows you multiple tarp configurations. And uh, it's just a reminder that it's not you know it's not oh, you're going to need a tarp if you're up in the boundary waters for more than a couple of days. You might get this kind of thing. So the hammock under the tarp thing, fabulous. Not only does it keep your butt out of the water, but it can serve as a gear loft, you know, if you've also got stools. Uh, and, you know, some days, as you probably know, you can spend a lot of time under the tarp. So getting to know multiple tarp configurations is perfect. That's a oops, compliment to, um, uh, perfect compliment to bad weather. Um, I also recommend this Flexo line, the links in the, uh, um, in the presentation. Uh, this is just the, somebody invented this clever thing. It's just, it's a lot of rubber tubing, right? Uh, that allows you to make a instant clothesline. Uh, and, you know, it weighs nothing and it's super easy to attach to branches. And uh, as someone who has dried socks, dried t-shirts on a bush, only to discover, whoop, <laughs> they're gone. Um, you know, having a place, a dedicated place to dry your stuff where everybody knows where it is, uh, is great. Be, you know, and, and it saves you leaving it behind even if the wind didn't blow it away. The other thing I had never known about are, are waterproof cards. Um, they're made of like, I don't know, plastic, I'm going to say. Um, and, you know, uh, if you've ever had the experience of coming out of the tent and discovering that your kids left the, the, the cards out and now you've got a brick. Uh, they're, they're, you know, five bucks. It's, uh, it's another one of those great, you know, impress your friends. I've got waterproof cards things. And then if you're, um, for those of you who are first timers or, or haven't come very often, strongly recommend uh, an eye mask and earplugs. On a full moon night, um, the sky is gorgeous. And it's as light as day, even through the rain fly on your tent. And you, you just might not find it comfortable to sleep. So the eye mask is great. And earplugs help because, again, if you haven't been in the wilderness all that often, you know, the sound of a squirrel, you know, hopping on leaves can sound like a bear. 
<laughs> coming into your campsite. So particularly if you're taking, you know, some newbies to the to the boundary waters, uh, give them give them that option and they'll sleep better and uh, enjoy the trip a lot more. OK, fire making and possibly my favorite topic. Um, what I want to point out here is this uh, this solo stove kettle. And I want to talk about it in this context. You know how um, people don't have, you know, or have been reluctant to buy electric cars because they're worried about range anxiety. They're going to run out of gas. Uh, nothing worse than having, say, the first three days of your trip be rainy, 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 and you've used, you know, the majority of your gas canisters, and now you're rationing, you know, the tea and coffee water, which is just a shame. And this little uh, stove is the best thing I've discovered. Um, let's see if this loads for us here as an alternative to something gas powered. So let's see if they have some, come on, where are you? Apologies. Well, let's see. It, okay. Here's, we can, we can, maybe there's a video on it. We'll take a look. This, um, It's just, you know, it's sufficient for boiling water. I've made, um, had no problems making things like um, mac and cheese. Uh, and what's significant about it is you just, it's just sticks, right? And so you never, you know, you basically, you never run out of gas. Uh, and it is a, you know, it is a terrific um, adjunct that again, weighs little, and just gives you that peace of mind called, you know, I've always got, even if I run out of gas, I've always got something to make a meal. And uh, shifting gears then to the topic of fire making, you know, one of the things that um, happened during the pandemic is there were a lot of folks who came to the Boundary Waters for the first time and, and um, denuded the campsites. I don't think intentionally, I just think they, they didn't understand there are other better ways to get wood than, you know, hunting or trying to push through more brush off your campsite and just go a little further back and, you know, cut down a tree. Uh, and, and easily the, the best mechanism I've found over the years is if you just go to the windward, the windward side of the lake, the side to which the wind is blowing, you will find in almost every lake beaver wood that is piled up along the shoreline. And, you know, you can again with the kids make this a treasure hunt or just pick it up while you're fishing during the day um, but it's a it's a ton of fun and and beaver wood you know has already been the equivalent of kiln dried for you by the sun for weeks months and so it you know it burns hot it's almost smokeless uh, it is far and away better than you know breaking branches or cutting down trees in and around uh, the designated campsites uh, the one downside, if you don't have a saw, is that the ends, of course, are like this. They're, you know, they're beaver chewed. And so you want to think about how to split them differently than you might normally. And I, for years, I tried to balance them and then hit them and, you know, only to have the, the axe glance off of the, uh, the pointy end, which is a real safety don't. Uh, until I learned about this mechanism, it turns out that, you know, almost every campsite will have one of these big logs surrounding the fire and you can just lean your uh, beaver log against it and it, it'll chop through just as easily as uh, if you were hitting it in the more traditional top down fashion. This is another great, you know, way to teach younger kids how to use an axe safely because the odds of it, you know, glancing off and taking them out at the knees uh, is very low because you've got the um, the buck stop as they call them. So highly recommend it. Um, and people have asked me on previous occasions, um, you know, do you have a trick for um, when it's wet, you know, for finding or getting a, a fire starter that is dry? And I, I don't know if you've ever seen this technique of making a feather stick. But it's another great, you know, just amuse your kids for an hour, hand them a knife and show them how to make uh, a feather stick um, because once you carve off the bark, right, the wood underneath is almost always dry and feather sticks are just super easy to light. 
Uh, I guarantee if you send the kids off, they'll come back with 10 of them by, before you know it. And, and it's a terrific way um, to both amuse them and get, you know, get your fire started properly. And if you, if you really want to torture them, you know, go get some what they call Swedish fire, some flint and steel and challenge them to start the fire by uh, uh, with sparks. Uh, that's 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 just it's more fun than your Nintendo kids. OK, um, drinking water. Uh, another uh, favorite topic. Um, up in the Boundary Waters, particularly where there are beavers, uh, there is Giardia, which is um, a parasite that floats on the water. And uh, I, you know, I want to be clear: don't don't uh, let this scare you away. The lakes up there are so pristine that if you're in the middle of the lake. Um, and you just take your nail gene, right, and you turn it upside down while you're in the canoe and you dump it, you know, push it below the water line and then turn your hand up so that the air bubbles out. This is the water line then bring it up and then just dump out some of the water. You'll be fine drinking that water from the middle of the lake all day long. But it is a good idea to filter your water when you get into camp. And for many years, um, I used a, you know, a hand pump. Uh, to filter and then uh, it, it, it you know I finally learned the secret which is just just go ahead and get a gravity bag they're like same size it's maybe even a little bit lighter and you just go out and you you know you fill these and hang them from a tree and yeah, that one happens to be a 10 liter which is excessively large I think this is a four liter um, but you know you can walk away and and have it fill up your um, your water holding containers uh, at your leisure saves time saves effort uh, is very reliable uh, and then in terms of the containers themselves for holding water besides the nalgene i recommend this hydro pack it it like it, again packs down to nothing weighs nothing you can see i'm a little weight um, conscious uh, and in particular what you want to do is get this black one and uh, <laughs> the reason is for a luxury thing you know, some of your campers just won't want to swim. Too cold, just not, you know, just not interested. When you fill this up and you set it in the sun, uh, it the, the dark material warms it up. I'm not saying it's going to be hot, but it'll be perfectly acceptable to dump over your head. And that's the first step. Once that happens, like, oh, fine, I'll get in the water. Uh, so these are, these are absolutely fabulous as a uh, great way to carry water. And then, you know, if you want to be with all the cool kids, of course, be sure and get uh, a Nalgene 4 in the canoe because you'll be surprised. You don't think you're expending a lot of energy paddling, um, but it's really important to stay hydrated uh, while you're out there. And uh, Nalgene's just the most practical way to do that. All right, moving on to cooking. <clears throat> Another lovely, oh, doesn't that look good? I could eat that right now. Uh, another lovely little hack is this thing called a fire wire. And uh, what what a fire wire is, it's like a, it's got a probe on one end that heats the wire. And so as you can see here, it's stuck through the sausages. Um, and so it helps cook them from inside out. And then by, you know, by looping it, you don't lose your sausages or your asparagus or your potatoes or anything else you want to thread on here your shish kebabby thing uh down into the coals uh terrific uh terrific little great gift for the camper in your <laughs> in your family um similarly this uh this fry bake i i don't know why it took me so many years to discover this so this is a form of a dutch oven which i thought i put here and apparently i didn't um so it is a it, it allows you to create a fire on top and it bakes, you know, the heat bakes uh, and produces just the most luxurious foods in the Boundary Waters, the kinds of, you know, cakes or deep dish pan pizza, right? And just melt that mozzarella from on top uh, that makes the, it just makes such a difference to campers to have these really luxurious, these rich um, meals in the boundary waters and you can you've got the time and this this fry bake is relatively inexpensive lasts forever uh, i strongly recommend that specific brand uh, and then some long tongs 
uh, you know, from moving things around um, because I, I think people have a hesitancy to cook on the fire grates. At least that's been my experience. And, and I think if you just bring these few tools to it, including the long tongs and maybe some gloves, you know, you, you're inviting everybody into the kitchen and it just, it just, it creates something very special. Um, something else that's uh, worth investigating is this idea of making a, a canoe table. So all you've done is you've stuck a log under the front and a log under the back so, so it balances, so it's stable. Uh, and the advantage of this is not only that it gives you a big you know, place to have a cooking surface, <laughs> but before I discovered this, uh, you know, I'd have a, a bag open like this, say, on that log, and first thing you know, uh, some mouse or chipmunk uh, was in there, you know, stealing my peanut butter. And they just, they can't seem to scrabble up and over onto this surface. So you can feel free to, you know, step away and, and the, the little critters in the camp um, are, are, are effectively held at bay. Hmm. Speaking of critters, that's how you want to see a bear, a lovely little bear at a distance, you know, quietly. And they are the cutest little things, uh, but uh, they do come into camp from time to time. Um, and I used to not take putting my bear pack up in a tree all that seriously. And we'll talk a little bit about the consequences of that on, on one occasion. Uh, but here's, here's specifically um, what I was doing is I was uh, throwing, you know, this is a natural, this is what you would like, if you didn't know any differently, you might just think, oh, fine, you know, I'll just throw a rope over a branch. I just got to go find a branch that's far enough out, throw a rope over it and, and pull my pack up. And there's, there's a real reason that this is not recommended. One is, in this particular instance that I'm describing, uh, we had arrived late. It was hard to find a branch that was, you know, this far out. Uh, it was raining. The rope was wet. The branch was wet. It was our first day and the food pack weighed, I don't know, 100 pounds and I'm like a buck 50. Uh, and I could barely get it up. Kind of basically created a pinata for the bear. Um, and so that's why this simple over the branch method is not recommended. Um, what you, uh, what it's absolutely worth doing instead is creating a single tree and pulley system. And for some reason that escapes me, outfitters don't spend a lot of time recommending this or don't seem to have them. So you, you kind of got to make one on your own, which again, I set over here. Okay. And so basically, <clears throat> What this is is an opportunity to um, use two ropes. Uh, the first is sort of obvious here, which is it's a lot easier to find a crook in a tree to throw a rope over than one branch that's sticking out six feet. That, that's so rare at campsites. So just throwing it, you know, over uh, is step number one. And then adding, you know, adding a pulley. This is kind of a fancy pulley, but adding a pulley also gives you a lot of leverage. It just there's some beautiful Archimedes lever principle at, at play here so that uh, pulling the pack up is dramatically easier uh, when you're using a pulley than obviously the friction over a branch, but also um, there's, there's some other uh, gravity uh, principles at work there. Uh, and the other thing I, I recommend is uh, it, it's probably worth, and there's a link, getting one of these. You're gonna ask me, well, what, what is one of these? Well, if, if you'll notice, um, what we've done here with the rope and the pulley uh, is, first of all, this rope is really, it's surprisingly thin, right? This is, but these things hold 80, 100, 120 you know, pounds. These, these ropes are very, very strong and it's light and slippery and you can use a weight that won't get caught in the, don't throw the pulley in, guarantee you it'll get stuck. You won't get it back. You know, this is a, uh, uh, it's, I found it on an arborist's website. This is what professional arborists use to um, get ropes over trees. And uh, I also uh, read in the um, Boundary Waters Journal, a terrific uh, publication about some guys 
who had, you know, they tied a rock and they were, they were, they were, I, I remember they were four days from anywhere and they tied this rock to the end of the rope and thrown it up and had gotten stuck. And as the guy was yanking it to pull it down, it came down and knocked out all four of his front teeth. And, the, and they're, you know, and they're three days from anywhere. Uh, and that's when I did a little more research and got, you know, this is, this is soft, it's slippery, it, it doesn't get stuck in trees. And, and this rope, when you throw it, you know, it, it, it just sings. I mean, you can, you can hit any, uh, any target and then, you know, just running the other line through it to pull it up makes it simple. You might say, okay, Tiger, you know, that seems like an awful lot of, you know, awful lot of messing around, but let me, let me just, let me just show you what bears can do because I myself didn't know. You're kidding me. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. No way. He's gonna Look. fall. He's gonna... Oh no, he's gonna fall. He's gonna fall. He's gonna fall. Oh, hold on, bear. Look at this. Hold on. Oh, little guy, hold on. He's... Oh, he's for sure falling. He can't get back. Oh, he's gonna fall. He's uh oh, the, he's leaving oh no! <laughs> Hang on! No way! <laughs> I can't believe it. If I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe it. Look at this. You're kidding me. There he goes. Oh! oh. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, a thing to note there is that uh, that rope, you know, was clothesline. And in the design we talked about earlier, it's not. It's at a 45 degree angle, which makes it, you know, very difficult for the bear, um, <laughs> for the bear to do what this little one did. Uh, in my instance, and this is on Lake One, I had left the pack hanging, you know, I don't know, it must have been maybe six feet high because we were tired and it was late and it was wet and so on and so forth. And I'll be darned if in the middle of the night we didn't just hear the bear and he had he had torn through the bottom of the pack, emptied the pack on the ground and we're banging our paddles and throwing rocks and he's just like, mmm, salami. And, you know, when he finished off he went. Um, but in the, you know, in the process, our trip was cut, you know, pretty darn short. Uh, so that's my, that's my caution about bears. Um, all right, fishing. Now I know some of you are, are very serious fisher people and you know, the reason you come to the Boundary Waters is to fish. And for, for that reason, I've got a link here to, it's an old article, but possibly one of the best, uh, fishing articles ever about, uh, the many lures that you can take into the Boundary Waters. Uh, and so that links there along with a bunch of techniques, but you know, for those of you who are just bringing somebody who's not all that interested uh, or kids, you know, you really only need three types of lures to be successful up there. And the, and the first is a floating rapala. It can be jointed or not. But the point of this type of lure is it's made of balsa wood and it floats. It has this little scoop. And as you pull on the line, the scoop will take it down 10, 12 feet. Well, why is that significant? Because you can have your kid, uh, you know, duff in the middle position on the on the canoe and cast out and the trolling action will bring the lure down and they're very likely to catch something, a pike. Um, but, you know, when you slow down to look at that eagle or you're around, you know, you slow down, the the lure floats back up to the surface and doesn't get snagged and then you aren't you know constantly turning around trying to free uh, the lure so that's perfect for trolling really handy for kids um, the other thing you should bring is a spoon there are lots of uh, different types of spoons the significance of a spoon typically is a it's it's somewhat heavy so you can throw it some distance and it's usually very flashy and it's just an attempt when you come into a new area 
to identify whether there are fish or not. And so again, you don't want to do what most kids do, which is they'll land on the campsite, go out to the point, and they'll just you know throw the throw it you know the same the same spot all the time. You got to use you got to use the Uncle Kenny technique, which is you come to the campsite, you go to the point, and you start you know at nine o'clock, and you throw nine, you throw ten, you throw eleven, you throw twelve, one, two, and three. And with this lure flashy lures like this a spoon that you can throw a great distance and you know and retrieve over that distance you'll know whether there are fish in that arc or not if you don't get it on that first cast just move go to the next point and try again and then move and try again i guarantee you with that you will figure out very quickly whether or not you've got fish at the campsite and it's a you know again a terrific lesson for uh, young kids about you know v variety and and um you know, working the shoreline rather than standing in one place, which is just uh, just a common, you know, understandable. It's so beautiful out there. You can just get mesmerized uh, uh, methodology for fishing. And then the last one you want to bring is some sort of floating uh, popper. And and these, um, you know, these are the type that create those spectacular moments where you're just jigging it across the top of the surface and the fish comes from nowhere with a giant splash. It's sort of the quintessential fishing moment in the Boundary Waters. Um, but, you know, the truth is you can get away with very little fishing tackle and still have a very, you know, spectacular trip in the Boundary Waters. Now, on the topic of safety when it comes to fishing, uh, I, you know, I strongly uh, recommend, and there are links, you know, to this lure wrap, uh, that you use something like this. It's, again, inexpensive. It just, you know, it allows you to, um, allows you to wrap the lure to the pole. And then, you know, whether the pole is attached in the canoe and you're portaging it, or whether the pole is up and bungee dealy bob to a tree, uh, it just keeps that hook out of the way and I, I tell you what there are more trips to boundary waters that are ended by you know bad hook experiences than just about any other certainly more than lightning strikes bear attacks uh, you know uh and so it's also good to learn how to uh, remove a hook from your uh, from your finger and so you know i encourage you to just um print this and and bring it with you um, because it's entirely possible that uh, that this will occur um, the other thing I can say about getting a, a, a hook in your hand, as, as I have, um, on one occasion it went in right, right here and then the hook came up under my nail so I couldn't push it through, I couldn't use the advance and uh, cut technique, is that, you know, if you've got a hook in your hand, well let me say it this way, if you've got cancer, go to the Mayo Clinic. You know, if you've got uh, Parkinson's, go to the Cleveland Clinic, you know, the, the world premier medical centers. If you've got a hook in your hand, <laughs> go to the Ely Community Hospital. Uh, this was many years ago, but in I went with a treble hook in my hand and uh, they have this terrific shtick. Uh, you know, it was quiet in the, uh, as I walked into the ER and somebody got on the PA and did this hook in the hand, code blue, hook in the hand. <laughs> and doctors come running, pushing a crash card. And they uh, took me to a very special room um, where they, you know, numbed up the finger and uh, removed the hook. That part was sort of unremarkable in the end. What was remarkable though, was then they wheeled in a life-sized mannequin, a life-sized mannequin. And what you do is you take you take the hook out of wherever it was in you and you get to go put it in the mannequin. And I tell you, this thing had been around apparently for 13 years. It looked like it was wearing chain mail armor. There were hooks every hooks in the eyes, hooks in the ears, hooks in the nose, hooks in the, you it, hooks everywhere. I could barely find room, you know, to put my hook in the hand. And then on the back wall, there are there's a giant map of the boundary waters. <laughs> And you got to go up and put your initials uh, where, you know, in the lake where your um, hook, where you hooked yourself. Uh, in, my, in my case, mine were the only initials in the parking lot. I was, I was putting the fishing rod in the back of the car without one of those lure wraps. And I'll be darned if it didn't just hook on something, come loose and come flying forward into my hand. Uh, so, uh, 
you, know, you, know, you, you just sort of never know. All right, and then uh, finally on the topic of uh, route planning, um, for those of you who haven't discovered it, the Friends website has this terrific, I mean terrific, interactive um, map that allows you to do things like choose your skill level, right, or choose the number of days, and then it, you know, it gives you very specific routes that you can take. I, I think it's absolutely one of the best resources out there for uh, route planning. Uh, there's another website called Paddle Planner that's good too, but this one is simpler to use and free. And then always obviously bring a spare map. Uh, my wife and I were way deep into the Boundary Waters and came across, you know, a, a whole bunch of maps that have been left on a portage. Uh, and, you know, the problem is you lose your map. You know, everything looks alike out there. You're just going to have to retrace your steps, go back the way you came, unless you're very familiar with the area. So I always have a laminated copy of a map just you know just a big one of the entire area and keep it in the bottom of the pack and hope i never have to use it and then uh finally um you know <sighs> permits have been so hard to come by that you might think you're skunked you you know you're you're not able to enter the boundary waters but here's a little uh interesting little tip uh, from actually from the forest service quite close to the Boundary Waters, off, just off of Burnside Lake, um, there is a circle route for which you do not need permits. And it's surprisingly similar to the Boundary Waters in that, you know, they have vault toilets and they have fire grates and it's portages. Um, and even though I think power boats might be allowed on this, uh, you rarely if ever see them there. So this is just, uh, uh, you know, a thing to know if you ever get, um, discouraged because you can't get a permit. There is an alternate route and it's it's almost equally beautiful. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap and just um, remind you that uh, at tinyurl.com backslash portage, there is this presentation uh, and I've got it set to comment. So I'd encourage you to you know add ideas or add other tips and tricks because we'd like to gather from the very many of you who attended uh, additional ideas so we can just improve this presentation as we go forward into future years. So thanks for your time and happy to take any questions. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tiger. This was super helpful. I know a lot of folks in the comments have, you know, agreed with a lot of your tips and found them very helpful. Uh, we do have some questions here and I'll encourage people to keep adding them um, into the Q&A feature. Let's see. Um, I, someone was commenting on the kayak paddle that you had towards the beginning. How well does that work? Uh, is that something that you'd recommend for folks? Yeah, I'd only recommend it for a solo canoe with the seat in the center. Uh, if you try, if, I have tried using it, you know, in the bow and the stern and it's, it's uh, not so much. But yeah, for solo, especially on windy days, I mean, there's some days where um, you know, it actually works better, right? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I see a question from Maddie here about bringing a dog. Do you have any tips, tricks, or lessons learned about um, paddling <laughs> with the dog in the boundary waters? I, I choose the dog's temperament wisely. <laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, we, we always put Rufus and all the prior dogs in a, a life vest. Um, and it's not frankly because they can't swim. It's just because they typically have a handle. Uh, and the model, if you're, you know, if you're looking for a life vest, there's one called an underdog. And so instead of the flotation being on the back, it's on the bottom. And so the, the ability to, you know, if he jumps out, the ability to reach over and grab the handle on the top and lift him uh, is much greater than, but I, I imagine all, they must all do something like that these days, but yeah, life fest. Oh, uh, absolutely, bear bell. Bear bell on the dog, um, not, um, not because it's gonna scare a bear away, it might, um, but just, so you, you know, you just kind of have an idea of where the dog is without having to always tie him up. Uh, the bear bell does that. And then, glad you asked, third thing, um, brush, if you brush your dog in the campsite and then you scatter the, uh, the fur um, around your tents and around the campsite, in theory, that keeps critters away. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but it's another great thing to give the kids to do.
Great. Well, that's helpful. Yes. Um, I saw a question just pop up about um, lightning. Any tips for dealing with lightning safety when you're in camp? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the biggest one is, uh, are you familiar with the lightning position? That's where you take your life vest and you get out on a, you know, you're trying to find something like um, a, a flat rock or a rock surface. Uh, avoid, uh, obviously, tree roots that are coming out. Right. And then you will you will sit, you'll crouch on the life vest themselves, which provide a little bit of insulation. Um, you know, you can also use, depending on what you've got with you, a sleeping mat or something similar. Um, but if it's, um, you know, if it's if it's if it's quite serious, you know, get out of your tents and get in the lightning position on, you know, on a surface that's not a conductor. Um, but again, I, I here's what I will tell you. The number of people who um, get hurt or killed by lightning is like this. You know how it happens? You're uh, you're whittling a stick and you you know you cut your finger deeply. You're you're using an axe, but you're not using say that buck stop uh, and and you you know hit your leg. Uh, you forget eye protection while using an axe. Um, it's it's all the you know, you <laughs> hook in the hand, uh, and you and you really just can't get it out. It's those things that that are almost as dangerous or more more dangerous than the things that seem like they're higher risk but happen so infrequently as to, you know, not be a real uh, a real danger. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, yeah, that's that's helpful. Everybody, be careful out there. Wear your eye protection. Um, Life vest, life vest, life, life vest, vest. Yeah. always life vest, yeah. Especially these days, I know there's a lot of rapid water and cold water temperatures. Um, if you're going up in the next couple of weeks, that's a big safety one. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking, uh, do you purely use the solo stove or is that a backup? And any issues boiling water after days of rain? Um, so I, I use it as a, as a backup. Um, you know, it does take some patience, right? You're going to have to, <laughs> you're going to have to light that little fire and you're going to keep feeding it. Um, but that's also entertainment and it can be very Zen, right? To sit there and feed it. But, you know, some mornings you just want to get up and fire up the gas and get your coffee going. Uh, but it's such a range extender. It's ridiculous. You know, you can, you can go, you know, you can go an extra couple days if you have to without gas, you know, so it, it's more of a, it's, it's a mental thing. Um, so I, you know, I, I find, uh, I just find it makes a huge difference to everyone involved and, and you just don't, you don't feel like you're scrimping and saving and meeting out the little bit of gas that you think you have left. So I, I, I suppose you could, you could in theory, just use it if you wanted to, certainly if you're going solo and you want to go really lightweight. Great. Yeah, lots of helpful tips. And I realize we're kind of running to the end of our hour here. Um, I will maybe try to get to one more of these questions. Sure. I see um, Emily asked, any recommendations for online Boundary Waters forums or root condition updates, um, especially regarding water levels or portage conditions? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I um, you know, the, the BWCA.com forum is great. Um, I, I like, so my favorite outfit, I kind of sort of hate to say my favorite outfitter, but I'm going to say it is, is Paragus up in Ely. And they're really helpful. And, you know, if you were to, uh, you know, reach out to them, they, they've been really responsive to me in the past. And I'm sure almost all the outfitters now are quite, you know, quite keen uh, to give you, you know, good advice because, of course, they not only they want you as customers, but they want you to come back safely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think all of the outfitters that I've worked with kind of across the board, they've got their, you know, they're up there. They've got a pulse on what's going on and what people are, yeah. you know, what stories people are coming back with, that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and it looks like, yeah, we won't probably get um, to answer all of these questions, but I'll just kind of yeah, put in a plug for going to that link, which I will send out um, in a follow-up email. And hopefully um, people can get some more of those questions answered there about gear and food and all of that. 
Um, yeah, so yeah, look out for that email from me. We'll also have a recording um, of this session here that I'll include in that. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for this for joining this afternoon. Thanks, Tiger. This is a super helpful presentation. Really, really great. Um, I'm seeing a lot of appreciation in the comments here. So um, we're grateful to have you have you on here. Well, thank you. It's a it's a, it's a joy to be able to share my love of the Boundary Waters and thank you to the friends because they're doing really, really, really important work to protect it. Uh, I recommend you make a small buy them a coffee donation online because they uh, they are helping us all preserve the place for future generations. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye bye.